Ford owners will be granted access to thousands of Tesla superchargers across the United States and Canada. Elon Musk effortlessly bought Ford Motor Company not long ago. As of three minutes ago, one of America's most iconic car brands is officially the newest addition to Musk's growing empire. But how did Mr. Mars Mission purchase Henry Ford's namesake company without anyone noticing? And most importantly, will Mustangs now come with self-driving technology? Get the no-frills facts and early analysis on Musk's historic Ford purchase that few predicted was coming. The genius behind electric cars, rockets and tunnels just couldn't resist adding a dinosaur to his collection. This is crazy because Tesla and Ford have hated each other for years. They've been rivals since Ford started making electric cars to compete with Tesla. It's been a fierce competition to see who could make the best EVs. Remember when Ford unveiled their electric F-150 Lightning truck right after Tesla showed off the crazy angular Cybertruck? But now, Ford's Mustang Mach-E SUV is competing with Tesla's Model Y crossover. The Mach-E costs way more, but people dig its cool style and decked out interior. The Model Y is pretty basic inside. So Ford's EVs are still stealing some of Tesla's thunder even as they join forces. But now, Elon has somehow gathered enough money to buy Ford outright. It'll be interesting to see if Ford keeps acting like a rival and trying to one-up Tesla's designs after the sale. Or if Elon will stop the in-house competition and combine the companies into one unstoppable electric vehicle powerhouse. Even though Ford had some early wins with their EVs, they've been struggling lately. Their electric car sales have started to reduce. Ford admitted their EV programs are actually losing a ton of money right now operating at a 40% negative profit margin. So maybe Elon buying Ford is actually a smart move to help them turn their EV game around. And some say he could even scoop up General Motors too, because people are comparing Tesla's stock to Bitcoin and dot-com companies before they crashed. Ford is worth about $36 billion right now, and General Motors is worth around $49 billion. If Elon sold all of his companies, he could use that money to buy all of Ford. He might even have enough cash left over to buy a big part of General Motors too. Even though Tesla sells way less cars, its stock price gives it a huge market cap. In 2019, Ford made $37 billion in sales, and General Motors made $35.5 billion. Meanwhile, Tesla only made around $6 billion. Yet Tesla's value is gigantic while it's still ramping up. Investors hope its future growth will be huge as electric cars take over, but not everyone agrees Tesla deserves its monster value. In fact, Tesla is the most shorted stock on the market, and short selling is when investors' better stock will drop. With Tesla shorting so much in sales, many feel its valuation doesn't make sense. Investors are really optimistic about the company's tech potential, while others think it's being talked up too much. Auto technical analyst Carter Worth warned that Tesla is acting like Bitcoin and dot-com stocks right before huge crashes. Most Wall Street experts actually recommend holding or selling Tesla shares. On average, they think the stock is worth about $1.500, way under its current crazy price. But Tesla megafans like Ron Barron still hype its potential for massive growth ahead. Barron believes revenues could grow exponentially in the coming decade. Other auto CEOs like Jim Farley seem to buy into Tesla's hype too and praised Elon Musk as a genius recently. There's an ongoing argument about how much Tesla's shares are really worth. Is it a bubble about to burst or a rocket ship to the moon? The risks are undoubtedly high at these prices. But believers like Barron say doubters will miss out as Tesla will grab Ford soon. As Ford CEO Jim Farley publicly praised Elon Musk and Tesla in a big way, he announced that starting in 2024, Ford drivers can use Tesla's supercharger stations to recharge their electric cars. Drivers just need a $100 Tesla adapter to hook Ford vehicles up to Tesla's 12000 plus quick charging locations. This is huge, since most non-Tesla EVs take way longer to charge. It's a big vote of confidence in Tesla's charging network from a major competitor. 
Ford drivers will be able to pay and activate Tesla, charging through their Ford Pass or Ford Pro apps once everything's set up. Tesla station charging can range from 90 to 250 kilowatts, while Ford's Mustang Mach-E maxes at 150 kilowatts. So Mach-E owners are kind of lucky. Tesla plugs have got them covered. When CEOs Elon Musk and Jim Farley announced the deal, Musk was at Tesla's design studios finishing the upgraded iteration of the Roadster model. He thanked folks waiting impatiently for the improved edition of Roadster, saying these things take time. Between Ford teaming up on chargers and finalizing the new Roadster, Tesla has much to offer. Even with Tesla and Ford battling for EV sales, their CEOs seem friendly. Farley is looking past the rivalry to cooperate where it benefits electric vehicle owners. It's pretty cool to see big automakers team up at times. Ford's deal to use Tesla chargers is a crafty move to boost Ford's Mach-E and Lightning sales. But Farley's over-the-top praise of Musk during a half-hour announcement raised eyebrows. His non-stop flattering seemed less about courtesy and more about trying to gain favour from the Tesla titan. Let's look at Elon's moment of awkwardness as Farley showered him with praise. It was more like when one poor company got support from a wealthy tycoon and started cheering, hoping they wouldn't leave them in the middle of the way. He kept repeating what a really big deal the partnership was. He thanked Musk excitedly many times for the agreement to share Tesla's charging stations with Ford drivers. He talked about how much he loves the locations Tesla chose, the reliability of the chargers, the easy-to-use connectors, and the software that guides users to the chargers. He even shared a family story about how his kids kept pointing out Tesla chargers when they were on a road trip last year. Farley doesn't have nearly as many electric car customers as Musk, but wants Ford owners to be able to use Tesla's chargers starting early next year. Musk seemed embarrassed by the non-stop compliments. He had to interrupt and suggest they start taking questions from the media, but Farley made sure everyone knew how excited he was to work with Tesla. Tesla's stock has shot up so high, and it gave Elon Musk a ton more money to play with. It's over $260 billion now. This much cash means Elon can easily afford to buy the Ford Motor Company worth around $50 billion. Ford better watch out. Getting bought by Elon could really shake things up. They might have to cancel or delay some of the new vehicles they were planning since the market isn't as profitable as Ford hoped. Even $50 billion is a crazy amount of money for one dude to spend. But Elon probably sees big value in bringing his archenemy Ford under his control. This mega-purchase gives Elon major power to dominate the auto industry. Will he change Ford's plans once he's in charge? Let's keep our eyes on his next move. Elon will invest tons more money into new Tesla factories all over China. More factories mean they can make more cars faster and score bigger profits. He plans to take those extra earnings and buy Ford bit by bit over time. That's smarter than buying all of Ford at once which would totally wipe out his funds. This gradual purchase keeps money free for other stuff. Looks like the sneaky plan is already happening based on company stocks lately. But rival car companies like Lucid and Rivian have plummeted hard, probably scared of what Tesla will become. Between bigger profits and slow Ford buying, Elon is on his way to forming a huge electric car empire. None of the investors knows whether his tactics here are brilliant business moves or kind of sinister. Both Tesla and Ford say the charger adapters allowing their cars to share charging stations will be cheap, not hundreds of dollars like some feared. They also promise no speed penalties for fast charging either brand's cars. Starting in 2025, Ford cars will have the same charger port that Tesla's use for charging up. It's called the NACS port so Ford owners won't need some clunky adapter anymore to charge their EVs. They can just plug straight into Tesla charging stations. Pretty cool move by Ford. Making their cars compatible with Tesla chargers will make life easier for Ford drivers, and it shows the company is getting more serious about transitioning to more electric. They're even copying Tesla's charging designs now. This is big news for Ford owners down the road. No more annoying adapters. In just a few years, Ford will share those slick Tesla-style charging ports. The EV future is coming fast, and Ford is kicking things into high gear.
Elon is smart to team up with Ford's abundant factories to build more Teslas, way cheaper than making brand new ones. Teaming up with suppliers instead of using totally different ones like now will also cut costs big time. Centralizing manufacturing and suppliers gives Tesla an edge. At the same time, Ford's factories make more cars faster and suppliers reduce costs when working together. Pretty clever way for Elon to grow his EV empire on Ford's dime. Would it be wrong for Ford to help their new owner? Buying Ford gives Tesla some neat perks too. Since Ford already manufactures cars in China, the partnership gives Tesla its first foot in the door to make and sell vehicles there. Huge new market potential. When Ford was struggling with sales, Elon encouraged them that they bounce back since their marketing is top-notch, like the insanely popular F-150 Lightning. This mutual respect could lead to an even deeper partnership between the auto giants, kind of like what Fiat and Peugeot did, joining forces in one company called Stellantis. Working together as a single company might be more effective than Elon completely purchasing Ford. China is way ahead of the US when it comes to manufacturing electric cars. Their EV market is huge. So, if Tesla and Ford teamed up, it could be awesome for bringing more affordable EVs to America. Tesla makes the coolest, most advanced EVs, and Ford has the manufacturing muscle to produce them at scale. It's like the perfect combo. Ford could learn a ton from Tesla's tech genius, and Tesla could use Ford's factories to pump out way more cars. Together, these American EV bosses could take all of China's EV success and bring it back home. More people could finally afford cool electric cars. This would be a big win for American drivers, but there's a lot more left to uncover. If Ford gets bought out, they basically surrender to Elon. Then Tesla would have to invest a ton of cash making Ford profitable again, which could even hurt Tesla's popularity. As equals though, Ford and Tesla could thrive together on shared resources. This auto drama is fascinating. Though maybe best for Elon and Tesla to avoid controlling too much of the market, but monopolies can be risky. Tesla's planning their own $20,000 electric car. With Ford's help behind the scenes, Tesla could build their budget model faster. Tesla's $20,000 ride could be huge in developing countries. For people with not a lot of money, it would give them transportation that's basically free to run. Electric cars don't need gas and barely any maintenance. While the budget plans of Tesla energize investors about massive future growth potential, Wall Street's confidence wavered slightly this week. Lately, buzz about Elon Musk's big plans has blasted Tesla's stock up 35%. Investors hope he'll change cars and energy forever, but the hype cooled off a bit. Tesla shares dropped 3.8%, closing at $296 on the Nasdaq. The roller coaster keeps speeding along. Some folks on Tesla's board of directors have close ties to Elon Musk, like his brother Kimball Musk and the former money guy from Solar City, which Tesla bought. That $2 billion purchase of the struggling solar panel company made Tesla's stock drop 13% last year. Investors questioned if buying Solar City was a smart move by Elon. Family and friends on the board have raised worries about unbiased oversight of Elon but he defends them as people who've been with Tesla from the start and want what's best. The deal shows that things can get tricky when founders make business decisions. Elon's bold ideas excite some investors and scare others. The significance of this event would only be realized much later on. Tesla is racing to sell its brand new version of Model 3 sedans later this year. These are supposed to be more affordable cars for regular folks, not just rich people. The Tesla factory, based in Palo Alto, California, is also trying to increase production quickly. Tesla's goal is to make 500,000 cars total this year. That's a ton more than the 50,000 Teslas they produced last year. So the pressure is on to get this new version of Model 3 launched right and grow their manufacturing fast. Just to give you an idea of scale, last year Tesla sold around 76,000 cars total. That's a tiny amount compared to their big rivals. General Motors sold 10 million vehicles and Ford sold 6.7 million vehicles. 
Those companies are gigantic compared to Tesla. The company actually fell short of its goal to sell 80,000 cars last year. As you can see, it's got a long way to go to catch the major brands that sell millions. But Tesla's vision is to keep rapidly growing production in the coming years. This massive gap in production volume explains why Elon Musk is so eager to acquire Ford's expansive manufacturing capabilities. By combining forces with an established titan like Ford with global scale supply chains and production facilities, Tesla can accelerate its growth and begin competing on the level of General Motors. The expertise and infrastructure Ford brings to the table allow Tesla to boost output rapidly. Can a small, sustainability-focused car company become as big as century-old giants in the industry? Musk has defied the odds before. Maybe he can again and make Tesla more than just a blip for General Motors. He recently hinted that Tesla's new edition of Cybertruck electric pickup could be more affordable than Ford's new F-150 Lightning EV truck. When Tesla first announced the Cybertruck concept back in 2019, they estimated the base version would start at about $40,000. The fanciest three-motor edition was supposed to be around $70,000. But since then, Tesla removed the pricing from their website. Car companies often advertise the best possible specs, like max range or performance. But you can't actually get the best of everything for the lowest price. So while we don't know the final new edition Cybertruck pricing yet, Musk wants it to beat out the Ford F-150 Lightning's price. The Ford truck starts around $40,000 too, but has less range. Musk is competitive and really wants the new Cybertruck to dominate the new electric truck market. But folks will have to wait for final pricing to know if it can really compete on affordability. People who made reservations to buy a new edition of the four-motor Cybertruck were promised about 1,500 miles of range. But two years later, there's still no set sale date or pricing information from Tesla. Some rumors said the first Cybertrucks delivered may not have as much range or power as expected. But now, Elon announced these pickups will go over 1,000 miles on one charge. That's way more, too. The catch is, that Elon also hinted the new Cybertruck won't be cheap. He said all the new tech and wild manufacturing for the Angular design would make it cost more than people thought. Reservers excited to finally get their hands on a new facelift of this wild ride may be bummed if it's way expensive. Gotta hand it to Elon. He always keeps investors guessing. Will the new Cybertruck be worth a higher price tag if it blows other trucks away? Or will sticker shock turn away buyers? Recently, some funny new photos came out of the new Tesla Cybertruck on Twitter. It was covered in a vinyl wrap that made it look exactly like a Ford F-150 truck. Tesla's CEO Elon Musk did this to play a prank on Ford. Elon made his new Cybertruck look like the F-150 as a joke to tease Ford. He likely wanted to brag that his electric truck could match Ford's best-selling model. The boss of Ford made fun of Elon's new Cybertruck. He said the weird-looking Tesla truck was only for tech nerds, not for people who use trucks for work. Ford's CEO, Jim Farley, said he wasn't worried at all about the Cybertruck hurting sales of Ford's popular F-150 pickup. He called the Cybertruck a cool toy for rich folks in Silicon Valley, not a real truck like the F-150. Jim said Ford makes trucks for real people doing tough jobs, not just to look futuristic. So he was basically mocking Tesla's truck and saying it won't take sales from Ford's trucks used by construction workers and farmers. You might remember Elon Musk made a video of the Cybertruck playing tug of war with a Ford F-150 truck. In the video, the Cybertruck easily pulls the Ford up a hill to show it's more powerful, but Elon's stunt backfired. Instead of being impressed, people complained the test was unfair to Ford. The Cybertruck used special tires, while the Ford just had normal tires. And the Cybertruck pulled from uphill, making it easier. The trucks weren't set up the same, so viewers said the video didn't really prove anything about which truck was stronger. This time, Elon's plan to embarrass Ford didn't work because people saw the test wasn't equal for both trucks. The Cybertruck price reveal is make or break when comparing its power with the F-150. 
Will Musk offer a much lower price than Ford and attract buyers to its power? Or will Ford's reputation and production skills keep truck drivers loyal? This is a high-stakes battle for EV truck dominance. Just when Ford lowered the price of their electric F-150 Lightning pickup to start at $49,995, Elon threw some shade. He said the Lightning seemed somewhat expensive compared to the Cybertruck. This started speculation about how the Cybertruck will be priced lower than the Lightning. The cheapest Lightning was almost $10,000 more before Ford's surprise price cut. When Ford first revealed the Lightning in 2021, they promised a $39,974 starting price. But the real truck ended up costing way more until this recent slashing. Elon's comments suggest the Cybertruck will be cheaper than the new lower-priced Lightning. That would mean a starting price below $49,995. Enthusiasts will have to wait and see if he can pull that off with all the Cybertruck's crazy technology. This EV truck price war is getting intense. Nobody knows whether the Cybertruck kicks the Lightning's butt on price or just on looks. Another new surprise from Tesla. They now say they'll release the next-gen variant of the Quad Motor Cybertruck version as the Ultralux choice. The new variant of the Quad Motor Cybertruck will compete with the four-motor Rivian R1T pickup. For the Cybertruck to really crush the competition, Elon will likely price it way under that. That would be a total power move. People expect a full-on price war between Tesla and Ford for the top electric truck spot. Elon has gotten really crafty at pricing vehicles to crush the competition while still making big profits. Tesla could dominate the EV pickup market. A new variant of Quad Motor Cybertruck will blow Ford and Rivian's trucks away? This beast keeps getting more extreme. The purchase of Ford was a game changer, a move that defied logic. It was like watching a chess match where the most unexpected piece had just been moved. Donald Trump goes to jail, and that could happen too, to be honest. Life is much more complex than, than left or right. It's a military operation. I mean, we have a military, this is like a war. And they can defend themselves. And Putin, you know, has so little respect for Obama that he's starting to throw around the nuclear war theory. You heard that, nuclear. We have a fool, a fool as a president. He said, we will never leave until there is complete and total victory. <laughs> we might be there for a long time. Some people say Biden's going to make it. Does anybody think he's going to make it to the starting gate? I think it will go a long way toward bringing our country together. Trump persistently escalates his criticism of Biden's open border policy, alleging that it not only compromises national security, but also strains the country's resources. With reports of a significant surge in illegal border crossings, Trump accuses the Biden administration of failing to effectively address the crisis. Meanwhile, the White House defends its policies as humanitarian and necessary to tackle the humanitarian crisis at the borders. Nevertheless, Trump and his supporters continue to advocate for a stricter approach, arguing that border security and integrity should be paramount. As the dispute between Trump and Biden over the United States borders continues to heat up, the fate of the country's immigration policy remains uncertain. Allowing thousands and thousands of people to come in from China, Iran, Yemen, the Congo, Syria, and a lot of other nations, many nations are not very friendly to us. He's transported. But at this point, it's the only plan. It's all that Democrats have. As the borders of the United States become epicenters of political controversy, the voice of former President Donald Trump emerges, vehemently criticizing the open door policy adopted by the current leader of the nation, Joe Biden. We delve into Trump's heated arguments, decrying the purported lack of control and security while Biden advocates for a more welcoming approach to immigration. Get ready for an intense debate on the future of American immigration policy. Joe Biden is gonna have a very hard time getting reelected, much less serving another term. It's impossible to imagine that. Yet the party cannot replace him because that would leave Kamala Harris, who is even more unpopular than he is. Then uh, in order for a community you know, to actually be shown, um, people who historically have disagreed on a subject must agree 
in order for a note to be shown. Trump's discontent with Biden's presidency persists, particularly regarding immigration policies and border security. His vocal criticism underscores deep ideological differences between the two leaders and their respective approaches to governance. As Biden's administration grapples with complex challenges, including immigration reform, Trump's opposition remains a significant force shaping political discourse in the United States. The ongoing tension between these two political figures reflects broader divisions within the country and underscores the enduring impact of Trump's presidency on American politics. The entire columns of uh, fighting aged men, and they're all at a certain age, and you look at them and say, they, they look like warriors to me. Something's going on that's bad. Now the United States is being overrun by the Biden migrant crime. It's a new form of uh, vicious violation to our country. It's migrant crime. We call it Biden migrant crime, but that's a little bit long. So we'll just leave it. But every time you hear the term migrant crime, you know where that comes from, allowing thousands and thousands and actually millions and millions of people to come. Could be 15 million, could be 18 million. In the United States, the debate over implementing a system of paper ballots in elections has become a focal point, with prominent figures such as Tucker Carlson emerging as staunch advocates. Carlson, a prominent conservative commentator, has fervently argued that adopting a paper ballot system would bolster election integrity and restore trust in the democratic process. He contends that electronic voting machines are susceptible to manipulation and hacking, making them inherently unreliable. However, critics caution that switching to a paper-based voting system could present logistical challenges and disenfranchise certain voter demographics. Despite these concerns, Carlson and other proponents continue to champion the cause, framing it as a critical step towards safeguarding the integrity of American elections. As the debate unfolds, the influence of figures like Carlson underscores the divisive nature of this issue and its significance in shaping the future of democracy in the United States. What would happen if we held an election the way that Americans used to do it just a few years ago? We should try that sometime. Here's how it would work. Everyone would vote on the same day in person. You would show up and present an ID, just like you do at the airport or the liquor store. Then you'd mark your preferences on a piece of paper. You'd do it manually. There would be no electronic voting machines. There would be no drop boxes or absentee ballots. The poll workers would probably be people that you recognize from your own zip code. They'd be your neighbors. They would not be employees of Mark Zuckerberg from California. As for the names on the ballot, you would get to choose those yourself, as citizens do in a democracy. Judges wouldn't be allowed to tell you who you can vote for and who you can't vote for. You'd get to decide. And then once you voted, nobody could order a stop to the vote counting. That would be illegal. Essentially, you cannot take somebody out of a race because an opponent would like to have it that way. And it has nothing to do with the fact that it's the leading candidate, whether it was the leading candidate or a candidate that was well down on the totem pole. You cannot take somebody out of a race. The voters can take the person out of the race very quickly, but a court shouldn't be doing that, and the Supreme Court saw that very well. And I really do believe that will be a unifying factor because while most uh, states were thrilled to have me, you know, there were some that didn't, and they didn't want that for political reasons. They didn't want that because of poll numbers. Then, uh, in order for a community note to actually be shown, um, people who historically have disagreed on a subject must agree in order for a note to be shown. Because Harris is a member of the new master race, she cannot be booted off a presidential ticket. She must be shown maximum respect at all times, no matter what she says or does. And so that means the Democratic Party is stuck with two fatally unpopular candidates. It's their doing. By the time he uh, gets out of office, because hopefully... The biggest risk we have is nine months. That's a long time. Right. A lot of bad things can happen. As I always say in speeches and rallies, it's if you take the 10 worst presidents in the history of our country, and you added them all up, all of the problems, all of the lousy jobs they've done. You can add them all up. It's not as bad as this one man has done for our country. What he's done to our country is he's destroying our country. Uh, we were just talking before. We were, the general was saying, I can't believe, he can't believe what's happening. They can't believe it's so sad. Last year, almost half of all ICE arrests were criminal aliens charged for more than 33,000 assaults, 3,000 robberies, 
6,900 burglaries, 7,500 weapons crimes. This is all migrant crime. 4,300 sex crimes, 1,600 kidnappings, and 1,700 homicides and murders. These are the people that are coming into our country. And they're coming from jails, and they're coming from prisons, and they're coming from mental institutions, and they're coming from insane asylums, and they're terrorists. They're being led into our, our country. And uh, it's horrible. It's horrible. And, you know, I know many of the leaders of these other countries that are doing it. And it's not just South America. It's all over the world. The Congo, a very big population coming in from jails from the Congo. You look at the jails now. You take a look at the jails throughout the region, but more importantly, throughout the world. They're emptying out because they're dumping them into the United States. And these guys try and make like, oh, isn't it wonderful? They don't have a clue. I think they're looking for votes. They're looking for something. Nobody's really been able to tell me how anybody could want it. You know, you're always in business. You always want to understand the other side. President Biden in almost every poll, New York Times came out yesterday with a very big poll for us. So they, uh, they didn't like that. And you can't do that. You can't do what they tried to do. And hopefully Colorado, as an example, will unify. I know there's tremendous support. They've they brought our support up very strong in Colorado because people thought, people in Colorado thought that was a terrible thing that they did. And while we're on the subject, and another thing that will be coming up very soon will be immunity for a president. And not immunity for me, but for any president. If a president doesn't have full immunity, you really don't have a president because nobody that is serving in that office will have the courage to make in many cases, what would be the right decision, or it could be the wrong decision. It could be, in some cases, the wrong decision, but they have to make decisions, and they have to make them free of all terror that can be rained upon them when they leave office or even before they leave office. And some decisions are very tough. I can tell you that, as a president, that some decisions to make are very tough. I took out ISIS, and I took out some very big People from the standpoint of a different part of the world, uh, two of the leading terrorists, probably the two leading terrorists ever that we've ever seen in this world. And uh, those are big decisions. I don't want to be prosecuted for it. Uh, another president wouldn't want to be prosecuted for it. It had a tremendously positive impact. It stopped everything cold. And sometimes you have to make those. They were tough decisions. Sometimes you have to make decisions like that. When you make a decision, you don't want to have your opposing party or opponent or even somebody that just thinks you're wrong bring a criminal suit against you or any kind of a suit when you leave office. I have that right now at a level that nobody's ever seen before. I have rogue prosecutors and I have rogue judges. I have judges that are out of control. And it's a very unfair thing for me, but um, serving perhaps as a uh, sample to others of what should not be happening when you make good decisions. And in my case, the economy was great. We didn't go into any wars. We totally defeated ISIS. Joe Biden will never say Lake and Riley's name, but we will say it and we will remember it. We're not going to forget her. It's been just a horrible story that we've had to live with for the last few days. It's hard to believe. And her parents are just, they can never be the same. Great people. We provided the largest tax cuts in history. We provided the largest regulation cuts in history. But think of it, no wars. We beat ISIS 100 percent of the caliphate. And there were no wars. We, we did a job that was great. But I, maybe I wouldn't have done that. The caliphate defeating them was very powerful. It was going to take four years. It took me four months. But it was a very strong dictum that I gave. I said, get them defeat him, end it. We were fighting for 20 years against ISIS, and we did it very quickly. I don't want to be prosecuted. In that case, it worked out very well. There will be some things that perhaps don't work out so well, but I don't want to be prosecuted, prosecuted because I decided to do something that is very much for the good of the country and actually for the good of the world. The president shouldn't have that on his mind, and he has to have a free and clear mind when he makes very big decisions. Or it's going to be nothing more than a ceremonial post. You'll be president, it'll be a wonderful thing, and you won't do anything because you don't want to be 
hit by your opponent or hit by somebody else, because who wants to leave office and go through what I've gone through? I'm being prosecuted by Biden, my opponent, because every one of these things, whether it's Fannie Willis or Bragg, these are local and state, but they're in total coordination with the White House. You can't do that. It shouldn't be done. done. I mean, a thing like that, uh, in the case of the DA's office, they put one of the top people, maybe the second person, in the Manhattan DA's office to get Trump. They had a Hillary Clinton lawyer leave the law firm, very prestigious, big law firm, leave the law firm to go into the DA's office to get Trump, Pomerantz, Mr. Pomerantz. So he goes in to become a prosecutor, worked for the Democrat Party and Hillary Clinton, goes in to prosecute Donald Trump at a local level, in total coordination with the Department of Justice, meaning Biden. And then you have the Fannie Willis, or as she would say, Fani, Fani, F-A-N-I, but Fani. And she hired somebody, knew the person long before this horrible prosecution took place. And she went out and she paid him an unbelievable amount of money, more money than he ever had dreamt possible, much more money than other people that are, that do that for a living. He never did it at all, had no experience in it at all. And they had obviously a conflict. We don't have to go into that, but they were able to get a lot of money because it was a high profile person. Me, I'm a very high profile person. So they were able to pay him close to a million dollars when he was not equipped to do the job and she's not equipped to do the job and that case should end immediately. That case is so conflicted, nobody's ever seen anything like it. And then you have deranged Jack Smith, who's a Trump hater and represents all the Trump haters. And he's going wild. He's just a wild man. He's been overturned unanimously by the Supreme Court. Went after other people over the years. He's had great failure. But he's mean, he's nasty, he's unfair. And the judges on these cases, they're all Trump haters. Other than we have maybe one or two that I think can be fair. But you look at New York, what's happened. I mean, these people have tremendous hatred. You can't do this to a president. And again, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about in the future. A president has to be free. A president has to be, if the president does a good job, I did. Some people would say a great job. But if the president does a good job, a president should be free and clear and, frankly, celebrated for having done a good job, not indicted four times and not gone after on a civil basis and not uh, demanded to be to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in fines on something that was absolutely perfect, where there were no victims, where the financial statements were absolutely flawless, where you have disclaimer clauses. I mean, nobody's ever had a thing like this. I wasn't given a jury. And I had a clubhouse judge just come up with this number on a perfect loan and very conservative financial statements. But even at that, if you look, the disclaimer says, don't rely on the financial statements in any way, shape, or form. Go out and do your own work. In Venezuela, it's a very terrible situation. When I left, they were in very bad shape. We would have done something very easily with them. Uh, just like we had uh, a lot of countries in very bad shape. As you know, uh, just to go to a different part of the world, Iran was broke and they weren't going to be attacking Israel. They had no money. They weren't giving it to Hamas. They weren't giving it to Hezbollah. They weren't giving it to anybody. They didn't have it. Now they're a rich country again. They have $250 billion and rich as you can be. And they're handing the money out all over the place. So, you know, a lot of things changed. Venezuela was in bad shape. Now they're in good shape. We actually buy their oil, if you can believe it. And we refine it in Houston. It's the only place where you can refine it, because it's really tar, much more so than oil. But uh, we would not be playing games with Venezuela. They would not be doing what they're doing. Now they're sending people, and they just put out a statement last week. We're not taking them back. They're sending their people from jails and prisons and mental institutions, and they say, we're not taking them back. President Biden, number one, stop weaponization. Fight your fight yourself. Don't use prosecutors and judges to go after your opponent, to try and damage your opponent so you can win an election. Our country is much bigger than that. The other thing I say to President Biden, close the borders now. This is not sustainable for our country. It's not sustainable for our cities. 
Our country is under siege. This is a violent thing that you've done. And many people are dying. Many, many people are dying. They die on the trip up. They die going through the border. And they die in our country. But many of the people coming up are from prisons and jails, from mental institutions and insane asylums. Many are terrorists. You see it. Many, many are terrorists. And I believe the real number that we have right now is probably closer to 15 million people. And by the time the term ends, I believe the President's term ends, I believe you'll be at close to 20 million people. That's almost larger than any state in the Union. Our country, it is not sustainable. Many of these people are tough. Many of these people are bad. They come from some of the roughest countries in the world and some of the roughest prisons. We have prisons in the Congo, in Africa, coming. We have people coming from all parts of the Middle East. They're coming from Yemen, and yet you are bombing Yemen. You have to stop. You have to close the border. You have absolute authorization. You don't need Congress. I had the safest border in the history of our country, and I didn't use Congress for it. And then I built hundreds of miles of wall, and the reason I built it and how I built it was I considered it an invasion of our country, and I took the money from the military. And the Army Corps of Engineers did it with me, and we did a great job. And we had the safest border we've ever had, and now we have the most unsafe border anywhere in the world at any time. There's never been a border like this at any country, anywhere in the world. They would have fought with sticks and stones to stop the horrible situation that's occurring. Our people can't stand it, and the people coming in really can't stand it, because they're dying. Many are dying on the trip up, and they're dying in the country. And also, many of the people are criminals, and they're doing tremendous harm. I call it migrant crime. It's migrant crime. It's a new category of crime. They're hurting our country horribly. And we've become a laughing stock all over the world. So I say respectfully to President Biden, you have the authorization right now. I did it. I didn't go to Congress and say, do I have the right to close? I fought Congress on it. Close the borders. You can do it right now. You have everything. Use my policies. My policies were great. Everybody said it. Use my policies. So just to finish, I have great respect for the Supreme Court, and I want to just thank them for working so quickly and uh, so diligently and so brilliantly. And again, this is a unifying factor. In this case, I mean, the polls show that uh, I'm much more popular than I was before weaponization. It's been weaponized like it's never been. This is for third world countries. This isn't for us. Biden ought to drop all of these things. And frankly, he may do better if he does, because people would say, wow, that was very reasonable. Look, they're all the state, the city, and the federal. They're all coordinated. Fannie Willis's lover spent hours and hours at the White House, I guess with White House counsel and with DOJ, plotting out this plan. Nobody talks about that. They're all, uh, they're all coordinated with the White House. It's weaponization. Never been done in this country. It's been done in third world countries, banana republics, never in this country. I really believe what they should do is really go all the way, go out and stop all of this nonsense. They're nonsense cases and everybody sees it. You just look at Atlanta. It's such an embarrassment to Georgia what's happening there. But uh, Jack Smith, I don't think is any better. Letitia James is terrible. She campaigned on, I will get Trump, I will get Trump, and then it goes before a Trump-hating judge. I mean, the whole thing is a rigged deal, and the public understands it. I'm lucky that I'm able to explain it to the public, because if you weren't able to explain it, the public wouldn't know. They'd believe what they see. So I don't want to win this way. Look, I want to win based on my policies are better. We're going to cut taxes. We're going to get interest rates down. You're going to be able to buy homes again. I mean, you can't buy a home today. The interest rates are so high. I want to win on safe borders. I want to stop wars. I want to stop the war in Ukraine with Russia. I want to stop what's happening in Israel. Israel would have never been attacked if I were president. Ukraine would have never, ever been attacked if I was president. Um, you wouldn't have had inflation. Inflation was caused by high energy prices. I had low energy prices. I would have kept them there very easily. 
And it probably maybe caused the war with Ukraine because Putin became rich all of a sudden. It went up so much. And I, I watched President Biden talking about Putin. Putin became very rich because at $100 a barrel, he's got so much money to fight a war. At $40 a barrel, he doesn't have the money to fight a war. But he wouldn't have done it anyway because I told him not.